as we welcome to our shores, visiting us for the first time, the Director General of the WHO, the World Health Organization, a household name here in Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Tedros, who managed the world's response to the unique experience of the pandemic, which occurred in the early part of the 21st century. Dr. Tedros, on behalf of all the people of Trinidad and Tobago, I am particularly pleased to share this table with you and to welcome you here to Trinidad and Tobago, you and your delegation, to have taken your time to come into the Caribbean at this time and to have accepted our invitation to join us. I know that our local media will have a few questions for you, as they've had from the very beginning, and I'm sure that you would be in a position to enlighten us further as we go forward. Trinidad and Tobago, like the rest of the world, experienced this unique event of a pandemic which happened in 1918 and then after that in 2020. And you had the honor or the onerous responsibility of guiding the world through this horrible experience. You distinguish yourself by your insistence that small countries like ours should be noticed, taken care of, and listened to. And the PAHO, your subunit here in the region, provided the guiding hand in ensuring that we followed the necessary protocols. And we in Trinidad and Tobago want to acknowledge the significant role played um, in assisting the government in providing the people with the effective response to this dangerous pandemic. So I want to publicly acknowledge and thank PAHO and WHO, especially your human response in speaking up for us and about us and in providing the respect for science in the face of a dangerous threat like the virus that we are now um, hopefully expecting to recede to the point where it becomes a part of the normal landscape. The emergency is over, but your role during the emergency was absolutely essential in ensuring that we survived even as we mourn the loss of millions of people around the world. So this morning, I wouldn't um, pretend to be the person that the media came to talk to. I know they came to talk to you. So please accept our invitation to speak from Port of Spain to us in Trinidad and Tobago and the region and the rest of the world. And once again, welcome to Trinidad and Tobago. I must say that um, we in Trinidad and Tobago have a special acknowledgement and uh, uh, happiness that you're serving your second term. We were delighted to nominate you to have a second term in recognition of the outstanding job that you did as a world leader leading us from dangerous desperation to good health. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Thank you uh, for the uh, great hospitality. And for me, it's uh, like uh, homecoming, because as you rightly said, you have nominated me for my second term. So thank you so much indeed. Uh, Your Excellency, Prime Minister Rowley, uh, dear members of the media, um, Trinidad and Tobago, Ahrich. Uh, good morning. It's an honor to be here. And I would like to thank His Excellency, the Prime Minister, as well as the people of Trinidad and Tobago for their warm Caribbean welcome and hospitality. I would also like to thank Prime Minister Rowley for his leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic, both domestically, regionally, and globally. The tough decisions he took helped prevent infections and save lives. I also very much appreciate the Prime Minister's strong advocacy 
for vaccine equity on behalf of CARICOM and other small states. During the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, WHO supported the government's response by procuring essential medicine, medical supplies, training health workers to do PCR testing, and much more. Just over a month ago, I declared an end to COVID-19 as a global health emergency. Although the emergency is over, there will, we, we still have uh, the virus around, so we need to continue to be uh, vigilant. So we must be ready, and we are the generation that lived through COVID-19, so we must be the generation to learn the lessons it taught us and make the changes we need to make to keep ourselves and each other safer. One of the most important ways countries are doing that is through the negotiation of a new international accord on pandemic preparedness and response. An accord is a pact between nations to work together for a shared response to shared threats. Unfortunately, there has been a significant amount of misinformation and disinformation about the accord, with some people and media saying that countries will cede sovereignty to WHO and that the accord will give WHO the power to impose lockdowns on countries. Let me say clearly that this is simply untrue and it's fake news. WHO will not gain any power to override domestic policy decisions, nor would we want to. The pandemic accord is an agreement that's being negotiated by countries, for countries, and will be implemented by countries in accordance with their own national laws. I thank Prime Minister Rowley for his support for the accord. And I encourage all small island developing states to engage actively in the negotiations and make sure that their interests are represented. Like many small island developing states, Trinidad Tobago was particularly at risk of COVID-19 because of its relatively high rates of non-communicable diseases. Non-communicable diseases or NCDs like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer are responsible for more than 70% of premature deaths globally. But perhaps nowhere is the impact of NCD greater than in small island developing states. Trinidad and Tobago has played a leading role in the fight against non-communicable diseases for more than 15 years. The 2007, the declaration of Port Spain resulted from a historic meeting of heads of government of the Caribbean community who recognized the devastating burden and consequences of NCDs on their citizens and the need to respond at the highest political level. Of course, non-communicable disease is not the only challenge confronting SIDS. You also face challenges including climate change, health emergencies, and adverse economic and commercial relations. In addition, the capacities of health systems in many seeds countries are limited, especially in relation to health workforce. They face challenges with, with having limited human resource and substantial migration and brain drain of health workers. And I appreciate his uh, prime minister's leadership in focusing on human capital and on, on, on workforce. Indeed, WHO lists 55 countries which should be protected against international recruitment of health workers, and 11 of those countries are SEEDS countries. And of course, I don't need to tell you that all of these challenges are exacerbated by the existential threat of climate change. WHO is proud to have had a country office here in Trinidad and Tobago since 1964, which is currently led by my very experienced colleague, colleague, Dr. Erika Wheeler, and supported by her dedicated team. Our collaboration with the Ministry of Health focuses on 10 key areas, including promoting healthy living, antimicrobial resistance, eliminating violence against women and girls, empowering young people, and pandemic preparedness. So thank you once again, Your Excellency Prime Minister, for your hospitality and support. And I would like to assure you and all the people of Trinidad and Tobago of WHO's steadfast support, 
through our country office here in Port of Spain, at our regional office in Washington, D.C., PAHO, and at, at our headquarters in Geneva. We are and will remain your steadfast partner as you confront the challenges you face and build a healthier, safer, fairer future. I thank you and back to your excellency. Thank you very much, excellency, for your kind words and your commitment to Trinidad and Tobago and the region. And we look forward to your continued excellent work at the offices you just mentioned in Geneva and Washington and elsewhere. I would like at this time to open the floor to a few questions from the media and I hope that you would continue to enjoy the, not only the hospitality but the homecoming in Trinidad and Tobago. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media. Um, now, you mentioned the, the pandemic accord. Now, one of the biggest challenges we had in Trinidad and Tobago during the pandemic as a small island state was the ability to get vaccines. Even though we would have bought into COVAX and stuff, it was still a bit of a challenge. Um, will the pandemic accord uh, treat with something like this, or is anything being done so that if we have another outbreak, major global outbreak, that we may not be in that same situation that we were in? Yeah, one more. Okay. No, thank you. Um, if there is one serious uh, weakness in our global system was, um, you know, lack of equity when it comes to commodities like uh, vaccines. And as you know, as soon as the first, uh, uh, you know, vaccines appeared in, in the market, um, the high income countries, especially who uh, own the big pharma, um, you know, stored uh, most of it. Um, and what I said, uh, you, you may, may remember I was using very strong language. Uh, for me, it was vaccine apartheid. Uh, and it, it shows uh, clearly uh, greed was, 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 was in play. Um, and uh, we um, really condemned, condemned that. Uh, but the way forward now is we should make sure that anything like that uh, to happen, we have to prevent it from happening. And there are two things we're pushing among others. One is the pandemic accord, uh, so that uh, products mm, uh, like vaccines uh, can be used in uh, or shared in equitable, equitable ways. And there should be agreement uh, on that, especially when we have a uh, crisis unprecedented like this one. But the other very important one is to build capacity in the South. Uh, and that's why we have established the mRNA hub in South Africa. Uh, and uh, this is uh, led by a company called Afri institution called Afrigen from, from South Africa. And 15 countries are collaborating from all uh, regions. Uh, and that will help in uh, building capacity or uh, local uh, uh, production. Uh, and that can address the equity uh, problems uh, in the future. Uh, because we believe that uh, production should not be owned by, by few countries. Uh, there should be production uh, in, in uh, countries uh, from the south in order uh, to, to balance. And there is a good experience. As you know, in India, there is good capacity. So having that kind of capacity in as many countries as, as, as uh, possible, so they would be able to produce these important uh, products. So it's the pandemic accord and also building local production, and we're doing both. Thank you. And of course, another. Trinidad and Tobago will and must support the pandemic accord because one can accept that there are volumes, reams of documents about how we behave with regard to world wars and wars in general and also international trade. But what the pandemic experience has demonstrated that we need equivalent commitment to govern behavior 
in circumstances like that. And that has to be anchored in the whole issue of moral responsibility and equity and respect for human life in general. The, the, the conduct of some high-income countries to oversupply themselves with the vaccines at the most dangerous stage in the pandemic, even if it led to wastage, while others could not get one for many dollars. That was one of the worst of the experience of the pandemic. And small, small developing countries like Trinidad and Tobago, we need to ensure that while we are small in size and income levels, we are not insignificant in the defense of the human condition. And Trinidad and Tobago will continue to, to advocate that the international standards be established and the, the doctrine that we subscribe to with respect to behavior. When will Trinidad sign on to that accord and has any other of the high income countries signed on as yet? Well, we, are, we have not signed on as yet, but we are ensuring that that is the direction for the post pandemic period. In our discussion a moment ago, um, I was asking Dr. Tedros as to what has been the, the post pandemic experience and the review of our responses, and maybe he might be able to tell us where yeah. we are with that. Yeah, so th there's still negotiation, and uh, we, we hope that there will be an outcome by May 2024. So we have a bit less than a year, actually, to uh, complete the negotiation and have an agreed document by all member states, the 194. And then, of course, the signing will start once we have the agreed document. Okay. And about the recently concluded World Health Assembly, our very own Minister of Health um, spoke, and he made a call for fast foods and these unhealthy foods um, to be not really regulated, but be addressed when it comes to the way they market to children and promoting that unhealthy lifestyle and the prevalence of NCDs. He even likened it to what we saw going on with the tobacco industry many decades ago. I mean, what is your stance on, on something like this? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm really glad that this is being discussed openly and measures being taken in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, because, as you know, uh, NCDs now are uh, major killers globally. Um, and these are cardiovascular diseases, uh, cancer, uh, diabetes, uh, and so on. Uh, and the risk factors, are, as you know, are uh, lack of physical activity um, and, um, you know, unhealthy food. Uh, tobacco and excessive consumption of alcohol and 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 so on of course it includes uh, air pollution whether it's indoor or outside uh, and to address this you focused on the unhealthy nutrient uh, unhealthy diet the key is related to um, uh, fat sugar and 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 salt so um you know, helping people understand what they're consuming and what the consequences are very important so they can make a better choice. That's why uh, food is being labeled, you know, to show the content of all uh, these this, this three so people can, 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 can have a choice. Um, yesterday during our meeting in Barbados on, on NCDs, um, uh, the Prime Minister Motley was saying, um, uh, you know, it's just to make people to have choices and to understand the consequences. So make choices based on the consequences. Uh, and also to, to have food available, uh, which is a healthy one, which is not in, you know, uh, which addresses the salt, the sugar, and, 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 and so on. Uh, but to really defeat non-communicable diseases, we need to have a holistic approach. The food is one, but we need to have physical uh, activity and no tobacco. And, uh, you know, in terms of use of uh, alcohol, uh, we, we, we have to be uh, careful. By the way, any amount of uh, alcohol is um, uh, harmful. 
So we, we, we need to make a choice as an individual based on the information that, that we get to stay, uh, to stay healthy. And I know there was an initiative, uh, Trinidad and Tobago moves, if you take the, uh, you know, the physical activity. Uh, I think regularizing that would be really good. Um, for instance, it could be weekly, free car day, on a Sunday. Everybody can come out to the streets uh, to walk, to run, to cycle, or to dance. Carnival. This is the <laughs> the largest. <laughs> so uh, I think that, that that's uh, really key. And the other would be um, it sh we should start from schools. Obesity is very high uh, in in the Caribbean. So how do we address that? Of course, adults should do something, but at the same time, starting from children, really helping them uh, with their choices. Uh, will will address the uh, obesity problem that we see. So NCDs, it's global. More than 75% of premature deaths are because of non-communicable diseases globally. So it's not unique to the Caribbean, but it's more even prevalent in the Caribbean. And you 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 have to do everything in all the four. And I'm glad that the 2007 uh, Port Spain declaration identified actually all these uh, challenges uh, and uh, I, I, I believe uh, Trinidad and Tobago will continue to lead and uh, address uh, the um, non-communicable diseases in a holistic uh, approach and keep uh, uh, your, your citizens uh, healthy uh, without the community without the citizens full participation it wouldn't happen because it's a matter of choice of each and every individual uh, that's why as you said uh, what the minister said is, is is correct we have to create the awareness and people should have the understanding and they have to make the right the, the right choice to stay to stay healthy Question from me before I give way to my colleagues and then we got to realize the hog in the floor a little bit but I'm quite interested to hear your thoughts on um, in our response to the pandemic, I think we had a very unique system where we had a parallel healthcare system, where we had an entire hospital system dedicated to treating COVID-19 patients. Um, so that way we didn't have much spillover into the traditional healthcare system and disruptions and that kind of thing. So I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on, on something like that. Yeah, exactly. We were discussing with this excellency, actually. Each, each, each country is unique. So you, you can have your own ways of doing things based on your situation. Uh, so uh, as long as it works for you, no problem, because you don't need to have a straight jacket from, from elsewhere. And I'm really glad that it, 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 it worked. And we should actually document it properly. That's how we identify also best practices. So others can learn in the future from the good practices countries had that they um, you know, created based on the experience they have. Uh, so uh, we like actually to identify such uh, good practices so that they can be used uh, in the future. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tejus, one thing we saw with, uh, sorry, Sonalala TDT News, one thing we saw during the pandemic is, uh, you know, misinformation, fake news, uh, basically on social, the majority of it on social media. Um, what is the WHO doing to remedy the situation? Because we continue to see that even after uh, the pandemic and so on. Mm. So um, I th the problem with that is, as you know, uh, social media, anyone can put uh, anything. Of course, social media has its benefits. Social media has its weaknesses. It's how the way you use it. Um, cannot say social media is bad and, uh, you know, we have to discard it because it's, it's helpful if we use it the right way. Uh, but at the same time, we have to make sure that um, uh, you know, social media respects the sources, uh, for instance, for uh, health information, which are the trusted sources, and how can social media, um, uh, you know, uh, divert any questions or queries regarding health to those uh, trusted, uh, um, you know, sites. It could be at national level, regional, or, or uh, global level. Uh, so if, if we do that, then we can use social media effectively. And we have started early in, in the pandemic with the big um, uh, social media institutions 
and they, they have agreed on our proposal, and of course they, they have tried their best, uh, but it should uh, continue. But, but the other side is government. From government side, how can they use the social media, but with uh, some um, you know, for citizens to use it uh, responsibly. So not only there is the role of the industry, but the role of the government is also uh, very uh, important. Uh, so these are the things we have been we, we we have been doing, and we provide the right information also on the on regular basis whenever we see uh, that there is misinformation and and disinformation. But all partners should work together to to address the, this very, very serious problem. Um, welcome to Trinidad, and thank you, Trinidad Tobago, sorry, and thank you for your service, and to Dr. Rowley also. Um, what was the conclusion of the pandemic? Um, was the conclusion that the cause, was it by bad farming methods or eating animals, um, going into new areas and eating certain wild animals where the virus would transmit to humans? or laboratory accident. Could, could you remind us like, what was the conclusion of that, please? Yeah. So, yeah, on the origin study <coughs> of the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, there is still no conclusive uh, result. Um, it's all hypothesis on, on the table. Um, some say it's natural occurrence, came from some sort of animal, then into another intermediate, then to humans, and others say it's uh, a lab accident and, and, and other hypotheses. Of course, we have been working on this for uh, some time now, uh, and um, we had a team that traveled to China to, to assess. Uh, and there was a report released, which still was not con conclusive. Uh, we have asked China to provide more uh, more information. Uh, but as you may know, and I have said it many times, uh, there is uh, no. Uh, we are not getting full access to the information uh, they have, uh, and we are still uh, pushing to get uh, get access because. Uh, knowing the origin of this virus is very important because of two things. One, um, science. Um, second, moral. Uh, when I say science, unless we know what happened with this, uh, how it started, this pandemic, it will be difficult to prevent the next one because another one may happen. And then the second is moral. As you know, uh, we lost uh, many uh, people, um, and you know we have a moral imperative to know why. Because even a single family, when they lose their loved ones and they don't know how or why, they uh, they don't rest until they know uh, the, the reason. So just likewise, so because of science and because of moral imperative, we have to really uh, find out uh, what happened and still continue to urge China to, to uh, cooperate. Um, I have a, another question uh, for both persons. Um, Dr. Tedros, right now the majority of South Trinidad would have been flooded and waters are receding. Do you have any advice for the public and as well as the policymakers on how they could probably mitigate the, the health impacts from something that widespread? And secondly, Prime Minister, earlier this week you would have said that um, you all were aware of this inclement weather coming and things were on standby to mitigate the effects of it. But my question to you is, if that was the case, how come there wasn't an official alert sent out to the public? What I did say is that we had, during this rainy season, advance notice of a weather system coming in we had no way of measuring the total effect, but we have an engineering problem on every occasion, and it still remains that if you get a large amount of water requiring to flow through channels, what's going to happen around those channels is as a consequence of how much water and the nature of the channels. As far as I'm aware, all the preparations were in place, 
and all the right responses were made and the alert was available. So I, um, I can't understand why you're saying that. And when the Met Office, I got my information from the Met Office from early. That's why I was able to speak to the relevant ministers. And the ministers would have been talking to their um, departmental heads and so on. So we were prepared. I mean, we can't promise to not wet areas that are required by the channels and the water that goes through. But I've seen that there had been a response, and I think the response has been relatively adequate. Yeah? We do have a rainy season where we can get deluges from time to time, and following that, the drain off is the natural engineering arrangement. Trinidad Express newspapers. Welcome to Trinidad and Tobago. I have two questions for you. My first is, uh, how would you assess Trinidad and Tobago's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic? What could we have done differently? What did we absolutely get right? And my second question is, uh, uh, what sort of immediate reforms can we um, put in place to be better prepared um, you know, in the event of, or if and when, um, we are hit by, you know, another pandemic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think I said it on my speech, and I appreciate uh, His Excellency's leadership on uh, COVID response and uh, what could have been done within the uh, uh, all the things available, I think, has been has has been done, and I think your colleague has raised even some innovative ideas of uh, tackling it. Um, so that uh, I think I can say was uh, you know a very good very good response. But uh, like all countries, of course, uh, there will be uh, difficult areas because this virus was a, a, a surprise and surprised even countries who, who thought they had all, 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 all the means. And it's a very uh, tricky uh, virus. Uh, and on the immediate um, um, reform, uh, I think we have been discussing, and the focus on human capital is really central. At the end of the day, it's the workforce that will handle anything. Um, how do you prepare constantly your uh, country, not only for pandemic preparedness and response, but even for the services. And during our discussion, that's what uh, His Excellency said, actually. The first he raised was uh, investment in human capital that he has been doing and he will continue to do. Uh, and then it's when you have the good quality um, uh, you know, professionals uh, that you can use to provide services, you can use to, pro to uh, identify uh, to prevent outbreaks or early detect and, and, and respond. So I think investment in workforce is central. And then the second is, again, it's globally, by the way, our advice to um, uh, all countries, uh, but which is happening here, is investment in primary health care. Because most of the health problems can be handled at primary health care level, more than 80, 90 percent. Uh, but not only providing services, even emergency preparedness and response is done at primary health care level because the primary health care is the bridge between the health service and, 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 and the community, and which we also say the eyes and, 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 and ears because it's when you have a strong um, primary health care, you can prevent outbreaks. Uh, at the same time, you can also detect, if anything happens, detect early. And, 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 and manage. So that's the other, I think, investment that uh, you know, needs uh, attention uh, among uh, other things. So whether we have workforce and uh, primary health care, one thing that we are asking all countries to shift on is to promoting health, identifying the risk factors in advance and uh, addressing uh, those risk factors and focusing on determinants uh, of health. It could be political determinant, it could be social, it could be commercial, and it could be environmental, and, 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 and so on. So addressing the root cause will be uh, the key area. It could work for uh, uh, non-communicable or 
or communicable uh, diseases. But there are recommendations uh, for almost the whole world to really uh, implement, but it varies from, from country to country. Uh, and um, uh, Trinidad and Tobago will take its own based on uh, its own situation because I don't think there is one size uh, fit, fits all um, and no straight jacket. We want you, Trinidad and Tobago to learn its own lessons and really fix because nobody knows more than Trinidad and Tobago about what happened, what are the root causes and how do you handle it. How do we do we? And I think from our discussion, that's what I can see that is ownership. And that's the most important the, uh, national ownership that um, can, make, can make a difference in identifying the problems and in bringing the change. We can recommend, but the closest to reality is the, the national uh, assessment and solutions it, itself. I'm a very strong believer of local knowledge and uh, ownership. I don't want to prescribe do this or do that because uh, locally, uh, you know, uh, no better, better than anyone who, who comes. But we will I, continue to support I mean, in any way possible, though. This is a good time. I may want to point out something to the local community and the international community. We in Trinidad and Tobago had fortuitously some resources available to us, which we used in a way that caused us to respond as we did in the pandemic, which some of those, one of those things will not be available again. We had three new hospitals, two of which were virtually empty, just about to be open, and a third that we were just occupying. That was a resource that was absolutely probably unique and we also had in the health system very high quality professional staff that caused the government to have access to a scientific response and WHO, PAHO and the government of Trinidad and Tobago and the healthcare system we place our faith in following the science and we also had that significant backup from the University of the West Indies, Dr. Carrington's role in helping us to track the nature and movement of the virus so that we could make certain decisions as to what we were dealing with. All of these good things were available to us, you can say, fortuitously, luckily. So when the government was advised, the first advice that we got from our technical people who were rooting our response in the science was, hey, let us create the parallel healthcare system using the resources that we just happened to have had. And that arrangement of occupying those new hospitals as a parallel system and expanding it into the other um, infrastructure that we did build out, the, the uh, campus in South, the, the facility in Takarigua, that helped us to keep the COVID response away from the normal health system because picture it, if we were handling COVID inside of our normal health system, we would have had a different experience. And if, if there is, God forbid, an outbreak of COVID, say in a year's time, we most certainly will probably only have one new hospital available because there's only one hospital under construction now, which is likely to be new and available in a year's time, and that's Sankh Gandhi. So from there onwards, to answer the question in the preparedness, we can prepare on the basis that we can easily construct a parallel healthcare system without serious interventions on the system. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a response that was unique, but we have a lot to learn from it. And while our response was not perfect, we did, in fact, punch above our weight. And uh, once again, the role of our high quality professional staff, which incidentally was in the public health service, that is something that we should all be proud of. While our response might not have been perfect, so what, what else would you do differently now? 
I don't know that there's anybody who can say otherwise. Um, COVID was a learning experience. We were learning as we went along. We didn't even know in the beginning what the virus was. We didn't know it's a frick, um, it, 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 it's it's the course of its way. We had to wait for the mutations. So clearly, we were coming from behind on many occasions. And we, as a matter of fact, we were waiting on WHO to give us the names of the new migrants. The new, yeah. um, so we, we could never claim to have been in control of the situation. It was a responding to the virus while we tried to be ahead in the preparations for a response to come. So um, I could say no other than um, it wasn't perfect, but it was very good. I'll probably someone will ask you this question since nobody else wants to go. Um, so what else did you and Dr. Tedros speak about, and could we expect to see some tangible either changes or something new coming out of this meeting? Um, well, Dr. Tedros covered it um, in, in terms of, um, most importantly, the post-pandemic assessment and honest scientific evaluations. There's a major missing piece, which is trying to find the origin. And secondly, um, we also have to, from a governmental standpoint, preparedness and being alert to the fact that this could happen um, is something that um, would form a major part of our discussions going forward. And thirdly, um, Trinidad and Tobago, as a small developing country, small in size, um, we have to continue on the international platform to keep emphasizing that we are small but not insignificant. And our voice has to always be one of the voices standing up for equity and moral treatment by the um, high-income countries. If, if, if we didn't know that, we should have learned that from how they behaved towards us during the pandemic. I happen to have been chairman of CARICOM during the worst of the pandemic when it came on us in the Delta days. And I can tell you, um, had we not have the support and the confidence that we placed in PAHO and WHO, it would have been really be a leap in the dark. And therefore, Trinidad and Tobago must continue to support the existence of um, WHO mm -hmm and PAHO and fully resourcing them to be able to provide us with that background. Mm -hmm. And finally, we have to have people who believe in the science. And, 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 and we happen to have, in Trinidad and Tobago, we had a government that was led by a scientist. I mean, my, my background is, is, is appreciation of science. Mm -hmm. We had a, a large component of people in the public health service. We had good infrastructure and we had good communication and responses from PAHU and of course I, 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 I shudder to think what was happening in the in Geneva when there was a threat of cutting the funding for WHO coming from some of the biggest uh, treasuries in the world. It was a very unique and frightening experience and I trust that if we ever have a challenge like this, not whether it's a virus or otherwise, that we are in a better position to get the best of human behavior. So you would have stated your support for the, the Trinidad and Tobago support for the pandemic accord, but as the head of a small island development state and the former um, chair of CARICOM, what would you say to these higher income countries, um, especially for them to even join this accord? That their wealth is not only theirs, that they have a moral responsibility to the rest of the world, especially when they have some responsibility for any deficiency that we may be experiencing on our own, not the least of which is climate change. We are having to find resources to respond to uh, um, the, the deleterious effects of climate change, which are largely the outcome of these high-income countries benefiting from what they did in the beginning when their win was sown, and we are now reaping the whirlwind. So they have a moral responsibility and a liability to us. And therefore, as we discuss it at the international level, our voice can only be saying that, with respect, of course, but with firmness. Thank you all very much, and thank, thank you. you once again for coming to visit us in Trinidad thank and you. Tobago. Sure. Thank you very much, and hope you enjoy your stay. Thank you.
Good morning.